and covered the kitchen floor using paint and pieces of linoleum, which we found at the city dump. We had electricity, and even though we could not drink the water because it was old and smelled like sulfur, we used it for bathing. We heated it in a pot on our stove and poured it into large aluminum containers that we used for, for a bathtub. To get drinking water, we took out a five-gallon bottle and filled it at Texaco gas station downtown. Along the front edge of our barrack, Roberto planted red, pink, and white germaniums. Around them, he built a fence and painted it, also using supplies from the city dump. To the right of our house, a few yards away, stood three large oil barrels that served as garbage cans for the residents. Mr. Barnetti periodically burned the garbage and hauled the remains to the dump, city dump in his truck. Behind our barrack was the outhouse that we shared with two other families. Sometimes on rainy days, the earth underneath would shift and tilt the toilet to one side, making it difficult for us to balance inside. Mr. Bonetti nailed a rope to the side wall to give us something to hold on to. The week after we arrived in Santa Maria, we enrolled in school. Roberto started the 10th grade in Santa Maria High School for the first time that year. Trumpeta Torito resumed elementary school at, Mason, at Main Street School. At El Camino Junior High, I continued the 8th grade, which I had started in Corcoran, the first week in November after the grape season was over. Ruben and Rora were still too young to go to school. Mama stayed home to take care of them. Even though this was the first, my first time in 8th grade at El Camino, I did not feel too nervous. I remembered a few of the kids in my class because they had been in the 7th grade the year before. Some of them I hardly recognized. They had grown taller, especially the boys. I stayed the same, 4 feet 11 inches. I was one of the smallest kids in the school. I liked my two teachers. I had Mr. Milo for math and science in the morning and Miss Ellis for English history and social studies in the afternoons. In history, we, content, we concentrated on the U.S. government and constitution. I enjoyed Mr. Milo's class the most because I did better in it than English. Every Thursday, Mr. Milo gave a math quiz, and the following day he arranged our desks according to how well we did on the test. The student with the highest score had the honor of sitting in the front seat first row. Sharon Ito, the daughter of the Japanese sharecropper, for whom we picked strawberries during the summer, and I alternated taking that first seat, although she sat in it more often than I did. I was glad we did not have the seating ar same seating arrangements for English. As days went by, Papa's back did not get better, and neither did his mood. Mama Roberto and I took turns massaging him with Vic's vapor rub. When he was not complaining about not being able to work, he lay in bed motionless with an empty look in his eyes. He took a lot of aspirins, ate very little, and hardly slept during the night. During the day when he was exhausted, he took short naps. Early one evening when Papa dozed off, Mama took Roberto and me outside. I don't think your Papa could work in the fields anymore, she said rubbing her hands on her apron. What are we going to do? After a long pause, Roberto answered, I've been thinking about getting a job in town. I am tired of working in the fields. Yes, a job that is year-round, Mama said. That's a good idea, I said enthusiastically. Then we won't have to move to Fresno again. Maybe Mr. Sims can help me, Roberto said. Who's Mr. Sims? He's the principal of Main Street School, I answered. Remember, he gave me a green jacket. Trying to help his memory, Roberto answered. He also brought me, her memory, Roberto added, he also brought me a pair of shoes when, I saw, when he saw mine were worn out. I was in the sixth grade. Ah, si, es un muy buena gente, Mama said, finally recalling who he was. Mr. Sims agreed to help Roberto find a part-time job in town. He told my brother he would let him know when he found something. Meanwhile, Roberto and I continued working, thinning lettuce and topping carrots after school and on Saturdays and Sundays. Several days later, Mr. Sims told Roberto that he had found a job for him. He had set up an appointment for my brother to see the owner of the Buster Brown Shoe Store on Broadway that Saturday afternoon. 
Roberto, Mama, and I were very excited. Early Saturday morning, Roberto and I headed for work thinning lettuce. As he drove, Roberto could not stop talking about his new job at the shoe store. His appointment that afternoon seemed like a long time away. To make the hours in the field go faster, we decided to challenge ourselves. We marked a spot on our rows about a third of the way in to see who could reach it without straightening up. Ready? Go, Roberto said. I stooped over and began thinning with my six-inch hoe. After about 20 minutes without rest, I could no longer stand the pain in my back. I dropped to my knees and continued thinning without stopping. As soon as we reached the marked spot, I fell over. Roberto did too. We did it, I said out of breath, but my back is killing me. To ease the pain, I lay flat on my stomach in the field, in the furrow, and Roberto pressed down on my back with his hands. I felt relief as my spine cracked. You're getting old, Panchito. Let's rest, Roberto said, laughing. I chuckled between moans. Roberto lay in his stomach next to me. I turned over on my back and I looked up at the gray sky. The dark clouds threatened rain. I am tired of moving every year, Roberto said, picking up small dark clouds and tossing them. Me too, I said, and following a moving cloud with my eyes, I asked, Do you ever wonder what we'll be doing ten or twenty years from now, or where we'll be living? Looking around to make sure no one was listening, Roberto whispered, if we don't get deported. Then he added confidently, in Santa Maria, of course, I can't imagine living anywhere else. What about you? Recalling the different labor camps we lived in, I answered, I don't want to live in Selma, Visalia, Bakersfield, or Corcoran. After thinking about it a while, I said, I like Santa Maria, so if you decide to live here forever, I will too. Right after lunch, Roberto left work to clean up and keep his appointment. I continued working and thinking about Roberto's new job. Every few minutes, I straightened up to give my back a rest. This is our chance to stay in Santa Maria all year and not move to Fresno to pick grapes and miss school, I said to myself. The more I thought about the idea, the more excited I became. Perhaps Roberto could get me a job at the shoe store, too, I thought. How about that, Buster Brown, I said out loud, flipping the hoe in the air and catching at the handle. Just as I finished my row, it started to rain. I ran for cover under a pepper tree and waited for Roberto. When he returned to pick me up, his mood was darker than the sky. What's the matter, I asked. You didn't get the job? Roberto shook his head. No, I got the job, he said, but not working at the store. Doing what then? I asked him patiently, cutting his lawn once a week. Roberto answered sadly. His lips quivered. Oh, no, I exclaimed. 